All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Austin Godber. I'm the director of engineering at a small company called Terrascope in town here. It's hard to describe what we do. This presentation does a pretty good job of generalizing what it is we do. Okay, so let's see. So stream processing in Python with Kafka. I originally made this presentation for the Desert Pi Python user group, which I've uh, been one of the co-organizers of for the last decade or so. I'm going to kind of skip the, uh, oh, stay awake. I'm going to uh, probably not get into the Python aspect in too much detail, but we'll talk about Kafka and stream processing with just kind of a, a splash of Python in it. Also, at the end of the presentation, I share a, uh, a link to a GitHub project where I have sample code and a make file that will help you bootstrap an environment if you want to try and do these things yourself. So that, that, would, that, could, be, uh, that could be useful if you really have you know, a use for Kafka. All right, so what is stream processing? So if, if it has a timestamp, I consider it a string, uh, a, a stream. Sorry, what is stream processing? Have I been saying string? Okay. What is stream processing? Uh, okay, if it has a timestamp, I consider it a stream. Because if it happened once, it'll probably happen again, and it'll happen again, and you could treat that as a stream of data. So there's a timestamp, and there's some sort of information along with that, along with that timestamp. Maybe it's coming from a weather station, and it's wind speed and temperature, or maybe it's logs, your logs from your Apache web servers or Nginx web servers. I would consider those streams. Uh, but a lot of times, and traditionally, kind of we, we process things in a batch manner, right? All that stuff gets written out into a file, then you process the contents of the file. Uh, that's one way to do things. Uh, the other way to do is, it, 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 in the way that Kafka, you would do it with Kafka, is to, to process kind of everything real time as it's going. So that is, the time that you process a record is very close to the time that the record was created. So if you have uh, temperature, Temp uh, weather, meet, uh, weather stations, you would quickly get that temperature from the weather station, put it out into your storage system, and then disseminate that out in the world so that you can make near real-time decisions with that data. And so that's kind of the, one of the goals of, of stream processing. But if it has a timestamp, it, it's a stream. Uh, once your batch size gets too large, if you're doing batch processing, sometimes there's an advantage to do, switching to stream processing at that point because you might not be able to, if it takes you too long to process a batch, your 24 hours worth of data, it, 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 you might be able to process that as a stream more quickly if you process it real time, if, if you architect things correctly. And stream processing may actually be cheaper, faster, and easier. And, scale, and then uh, also scaling to many consumers uh, can be easier with stream processing. So that is, if you have a scenario where you have this stream of temperature data, treating it as a batch might be difficult because you might have to get that batch to multiple people. If you want to process it as a stream, you could have multiple people reading off that stream and, uh, at the same time. And that, that, that's one thing that Kafka makes easier. Okay, so. Overview of this presentation is I'm going to talk about Kafka. Fortunately, that, there's only two super orange slides here, so we won't suffer through not being able to read the slides too frequently. Uh, we talk about Kafka, just kind of a Kafka in, in, introduction. Stream pro, I talk about a generic stream processing problem, and I have some snippets of Python code in there that we'll go through. And then there's a more depth Python example here, but we'll probably skip that tonight. Uh, so we'll just look at these two first things, I think. All right, so the Kafka introduction. So what is Kafka? It's a real-time streaming system. Probably want to put near real-time in there because the meaning of real-time can be pretty tightly constrained if you're talking about like real-time operating systems or something, then things have to happen in milliseconds. Uh, real-time in this case is also pretty optimistic because when things go badly, things you end up doing things that aren't in real-time. Uh, it is uh, distributed by default, so it's basically a data storage system, okay? like a database in some sense. It's distributed by default. It's persistent. So, okay, so by distributed, it, it scales to multiple computers very easily and it's designed to run on multiple computers. It's persistent in that uh, 
records you write into it will stay there for some defined by some defined period of time or some defined size or something. It's resilient, that is, it's kind of fault tolerant. So since it's designed to run on a distributed set of servers, if one server goes down, it has mechanisms to recover from that failure and continue operating while that server's out, which is kind of the important thing. If you lose a hard drive and you need to take a computer out to replace that hard drive, you can, you can do that. It's not completely free, may cost you some CPU time, may introduce lag, things like that, but it, it, at least it will continue operating. And it's also very fast. Uh, to give you an example of how fast, we have uh, uh, a several node Kafka cluster, say, let's just say six. I'm not going to give any real numbers here, I'm just going to kind of give a ballpark since this is being videotaped. Uh, so, so let's say we have a six node Kafka cluster and we have uh, data writing into that at hundreds of thousands of records a second. So tens of billions of records a day, hundreds of thousands of records a second, and multiple things consuming off of that. And you'll, you'll see more details soon. So it's fast. Okay, so Kafka's capabilities, uh, you can publish and subs you can publish, you have streams. You can publish to these streams. You could subscribe to these streams to read records off of these streams. It's similar to a message queue or an enterprise messaging system. Uh, it'll store streams of records in a fault tolerant durable way, which I've talked about a little bit. It will uh, process, you can process records as they occur, so with very little latency. So when as soon as you write the record into Kafka, assuming everything's caught up, you can probably read that, that record out within a second or two. Not really, and maybe sub, sub second if you're super lucky, but that's probably harder to achieve. And I, we, I don't really work in that realm. Uh, I, I usually, we work in the realm of just a few seconds or tens of seconds of latency. It can get completely, it could get worse depending on the scenarios, you know, things sometimes are, but usually it's pretty good. Uh, and you do have the ability to reprocess records if needed. Okay, so the use cases for Kafka, you, if you, uh, you can build real-time streaming data pipelines that transport data between systems. You can build streaming applications that take the data that's in the stream, make modifications to that data, for, in for instance, enrich that data, remove fields from that data, remove records from the stream, uh, or you can also make applications that react to the streams of data. So you can look, you can look at this stream of data, look for specific records, and when you see a specific record that matches some criteria, then you uh, can react to that. Do something, send an email or tweet or something. Okay, so Kafka is run as a cluster of one or more servers that can span multiple data centers. Kafka clusters store streams of records in categories called topics. So typically, you write your records into a topic, you read off that topic, that's, that's kind of how it breaks down. Each record consists of a key, a value, and a timestamp. I don't actually use keys or timestamps, uh, in the Kafka at least, uh, so I don't know a whole lot about those. Uh, so if you have specific questions about that, I may not be able to help right now. Um, yeah. And so, okay, so here's kind of what it looks like. Here's, you kind of have a, a Kafka cluster, which would be, which would kind of be, you know, a set of, you can add, you can have many, many servers in your Kafka cluster, but you can get far with, with a fairly small cluster. Uh, so you kind of have this central component, the Kafka cluster. You have applications that write into the Kafka cluster. Those are called producers. Up here in the top, those are the producers. They write into the Kafka cluster. They write into topics in the Kafka cluster. And then at the bottom you have consumers, which your, your application is, you can have multiple groups of consumers here, and they read off of the, the Kafka topics and they get the records, you know, they get the records that were written by the producers. There are also uh, some more advanced features. I've only, we started using Kafka before a lot of these uh, kind of more advanced things were implemented and we had to build our own, own tooling. Uh, to interact with, with Kafka at the time. So we've kind of solved the things, the problems these things solve, we've solved it a different way. But they have uh, connectors which, for instance, allow you to connect um, 
like MySQL to Kafka. So you could either synchronize records out of MySQL into Kafka or out of Kafka into MySQL or out of you know, Postgres. And you can synchronize two separate database systems this way if you wanted to by writing them in, by dumping out of MySQL, writing into Kafka, reading out of Kafka, writing back into my, a different MySQL across, you know, across the WAN perhaps. Uh, and then there's the stream processing systems. There's like a, a there's actually a SQL language that they have that works directly on the Kafka cluster. I've not used this since we do super high volume stuff. It may not work at those volumes. I have I have doubts that it works at those volumes, but I've not tried. So I, if it could, I'd be astonished. But um, so I'm not actually going to talk about either the stuff on the left or the stuff on the right. No connectors. None of the uh, we'll do our own stream processing, but there is a whole ecosystem around provided by the Kafka project and commercial entities around Kafka that kind of build on top of that. It, but we've kind of built our own stuff on top of it. Yeah, so we're going to mostly talk about implementing producers and consumers in Python in an example stream processing problem. Okay, so I talked about you've got the Kafka servers. You write your records into what are called topics. Topics are split into partitions. So they're append-only logs. And these partitions get spread across the, oh, the one thing I didn't, never actually wrote in this presentation, I probably should. The individual Kafka servers in the cluster, they're called brokers. So if I use the word broker, that just means a Kafka server. So, okay, so. Kafka topics are split into partitions. Partitions are distributed across brokers. Uh, if you can do so evenly, that will be best. Uh, if you don't do it evenly, you can end up with an imbalance in load on the servers or the brokers that your, your partitions are on. But generally, uh, even at the volumes we work at, we haven't really encountered problems with Kafka with that. Elasticsearch is another matter. I'm not going to talk about that here tonight. <laughs> Uh, okay, so each record has an offset, offset associated with it inside the partition. And then writes and reads are spread across the partitions. So those consumers, the producers will write across, uh, across the uh, par partitions and consumers will read across the partitions. And the, the way those reads and writes are distributed are a little complicated. We're not going to get into those details, but um, a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about consuming at least. So topics, and this is, this is super important, topics can have uh, retention size and time. So when you create a Kafka topic, you're saying, okay, here's, here's a group of records, here's a stream that I'm going to send to you, Kafka. I want you to not keep any records older than one day. So you can tell Kafka to, to do that. <clears throat> I guess that could be a big surprise to someone who doesn't realize it's not really meant to persist all of your data necessarily. You can. You can set, you don't have to set a retention time. Um, but inevitably, anyone who wants to store all of their data forever learns that you can't actually store all of your data forever. It either becomes too costly or usually just becomes too costly. Uh, but anyways, Kafka has a mechanism. Generally, it works as kind of a queue. Maybe you want to set it to maybe your process, whatever you're working on, you're like just storing a month worth, month's worth of that data would one be affordable and two be useful. Uh, so you can say just store a month worth or a day's worth. You can also set a, a retention size. That is, if, if the size of this Kafka topic exceeds that limit, then you start discarding the oldest records. And then Kafka topics can also be compacted. Since each record can have an ID, uh, you can say, hey, when, when I write another record with the same ID, just mark that old one as deleted. Uh, we've had problems with compaction at the rates that we work at. It could have been a misconfiguration, but we just kind of re retooled things. But uh, the compaction is actually kind of a costly process because the way, since the way Kafka works is that it's just an append-only log, that's super easy to do. But as soon as you have to go seek inside your, inside and search through your uh, topic for missing records, that, that becomes costly. So compaction isn't something we've, we've used beyond just experimenting with. Okay, so, so you basically have these partitions. You've got a, 
you've got a topic. It consists of, in this case, three partitions. Partition 0, partition 1, partition 2. The oldest record here is at the beginning with the zeroth offset. And then the uh, producers are writing just appending to the ends of these partitions. The consumers can either start at the beginning of the topic or the end of the topic. Actually, I don't know whether there's a right name for the beginning or the end or the head or the tail. I, my brain isn't very good at keeping those two kind of like opposites straight. So I, I, I'm not sure. Does anyone know? Those of you who do use Kafka, is there like a pro, like a head or tail? I don't I don't know. So, anyways, you can when you create a consumer, you can tell it, hey, start reading at the beginning of time or start reading at the most recent records. Uh, and paying attention to that's pretty important usually because if you have you know 30 terabytes of data in there and you accidentally you don't mean to read all 30 terabytes, you just mean to read the latest stuff. You got to pay attention to that. Um, okay, so. The other thing is that, oh yeah, these record IDs, so I, I want to just call out that these numbers here are actually the offsets within the partition, not record IDs. The record IDs would kind of be distributed across, uh, distributed across these partitions, kind of like that. Something that I don't mention elsewhere in the presentation, but it's probably worth talking about, is the way the redundancy is achieved is that uh, the if you, generally you want redundancy. I, I, I wouldn't deploy a cluster without uh, the, the redundancy, but you would set up, you would set it up so that uh, there would, there would uh, be another partition. This partition zero, one, and two would also be distributed to other computers. So let's say you had three computers. Let's say this was your topic. You had three partitions and you had three brokers. Uh, you, partition zero would be on compu computer zero, broker zero. Uh, partition one would be on broker one. Partition two would be on broker two. But then a copy or a replica of partition zero would probably also be on this computer as well, on broker one. And then the copy of one would be on two. And then the copy of two would be back on zero. And then there are background threads that keep the replica partitions in sync with the primary partitions. Might be using primary and replica incorrectly for Kafka. But conceptually, a lot of the distributed systems kind of work in this partition syncing kind of <coughs> mechanism. OK. Does anyone have any questions at this point? I, I kind of talk fast, and it's kind of a dense subject. OK. All right, so consumers. Multiple consumers can read from a topic. OK, so and remember. Topics are split into partitions. They're identified by consumer groups. Each consumer group, so each, you can have multiple consumers. A consumer is identified by a consumer group. Each consumer group stores its, is respond, either has the system store its own offsets or stores its own offsets somewhere else. And the offset is how far that consumer has read into each partition. So uh, let's see, actually, I may have, no. oh yeah, no, this is the example here. So, so for instance, in this, in this simplified example where there's just a single partition in this topic, consumer A has only read up to nine, and consumer B has read all the way up to 11. So you can have multiple, multiple processes reading off of multiple consumer groups or multiple separate, completely separate applications. And in, like if you're in a company, you have, might have one, one, one group, your R&D group, is, has an application that reads off a topic, and then your, your operations group might also have an application that reads off that same topic. And that's, that's what makes, and the cost, here's the important thing, is the consumers, multiple consumers, are typically very cheap as long as they're all reading at the head of the, head of the queue, as long as they're all caught up in reading the most recent data. Having multiple consumers is pretty costless, just given the way that Linux works and the way that, uh, um, Records are stored in, uh, there's a, a disk cache stored in memory. So all of, your, all of your recent data is pretty much in memory and you don't even need to read it off of disk. Uh, it only gets costly when you start having to read back at the beginning of the queue and you have a lot of, you know, if you have terabytes of stuff on disk, gigabytes of, of RAM, it's going to take a lot of disk I.O. to bring all that stuff out of, out of the, the lower disk storage into memory then 
give to the process. So uh, usually consumers, as long as they're all kind of working on, on the most recent data, uh, usually those are pretty costless, which is not the case if you're doing batch processing. If you have a process that's going to go read through your terabyte of data that's sitting on a disk, and then a guy in another department needs to read that same data, he's going to have to start at the beginning and read all that out at once. So, so, so all that I.O. kind of, there's no benefit. There's no, the cost of multiple consumers is much higher in a batch system. Um, I, that's probably, yeah, that's probably an accurate statement. Does that pass the smell test, everybody? Okay. All right. So that's kind of the advantage. I'm not saying bad batch is bad. I'm just saying that, you know, it's like, this is a different scenario. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, here's another thing I like to point out is that the number of partitions is the max parallelism for consumers in a given consumer group. So when you create, this is an operate, an, an important, because I'm kind of an operations guy. Uh, when you create a Kafka topic, don't be shy about adding lots of partitions. Because what, um, you can, uh, you're, you can only have as many consumers as you have partitions. So if you only have like three partitions, then you can only read off of three partitions at one time. But if you created 20 or 50 or 100 partitions, then you could have up to 100 readers, which of course, if all of those partitions on the same disk, you're not going to get much advantage. But if your cluster grows and you add brokers and you can move those partitions to new disks, then you get the parallelism of being able to read off of the, off of 100 disks instead of two disks or three disks, then you can, it's always good to partition. Don't, don't be shy about adding more partition. Don't, don't use the five default. Well, I mean, I guess maybe it, if, if you don't have a lot of data, it probably doesn't matter. But <laughs> this is a mistake that I've seen customers, uh, you know, call, have, have experience. So, <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of the Kafka from the server perspective. Maybe the stream processing problem sh project should be at the beginning of the talk. So then when I talk about Kafka, you're much more uh, kind of in tune to why and what and how. But here it is. OK, so now here's an example of the sort of problem you might solve. OK, so in this drawing here, each one of these uh, horizontal tubes here is, is a, uh, it, think of it as a Kafka topic. So here's kind of the raw stream that might come in. You might want to do something to that raw stream to make a modified stream. You might then want to do something to that modified stream to trigger an action. Or you might want to take that modified stream and store it in a different database. Uh, and in, our, in our case, we typically, it would be HDFS or Elasticsearch or I'm, maybe Mongo or dump it out into files S3 or something. Uh, and then it, once it's in that data store, you can you know, serve that out as uh, a web service. You could put you know, a web API in front of Elasticsearch or something. Uh, or you can just trigger action straight off the raw stream. This, this, in a nutshell, is kind of what we do at Terrascope. And kind of, we help customers build these sorts of, uh, I call it like it's a data engineering problem, where you have data coming in, you want to do something, do that, and you want to massage it and enhance it and things like that. And we'll see some examples of that. Uh, that's kind of the gist of what we do. Uh, and where does Python fit into all of this? Is Python the application, you'd write Python applications to read from this stream and trigger this action, or read from this stream, modify it, read from this stream, trigger an action, read from this stream, store it in a different database. So that's kind of, those are the kind of things that we're going to explore here today. Okay, so for example, hopefully in the back you can see, uh, I kind of have some small text here. Uh, but so, so imagine this problem. Noah. Uh, national, actually, I don't know. Oceanographic, uh, oceanographic atmospheric agency, something like that. Yeah, they, 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 they help watch the weather. Which actually, now that I think about it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, it, uh, this presentation was created in February, so the timeliness of this example had not occurred to me until just now. Uh, national Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Administration. Okay. Anyways, they, got, they, they have a lot of weather data, and they publish this weather data. And so you can imagine that uh, an in, incoming data in a, in, a problem, in, a, in, a, in a problem where you have weather stations, you have, say, a record that's a station ID that's some big gnarly thing 
that says USW 0003192, and then a date stamp, and then an AWND 2.4, and a PRCP 0, and a TMAX, and a TMIN. Okay, so, so this, this is the raw data, and what makes it raw is you don't know what this is, you don't know what these, you don't know what the units are on here. If, let's say your company wanted to use this data and you are responsible for manipulating this data so that it's easier to use, you might do some things to this data. So the incoming data is global and it needs a little bit of interpretation. So what we might do is we might take this incoming raw stream, write a little Python program that, that creates a slightly different uh, stream of a modified stream of data. So here's the example raw and then here's the example output that we would make. So what we do, what we're doing here is we're taking what we know about this station ID which was USW blah 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 completely impenetrable and then we kind of expand that out and we say okay actually this station so we add a we kind of add an object to the record here and we say yeah you know here, here's its ID we're gonna let you still know that but we're gonna also tell you that hey this by the way this crazy string, this is in the United States, that's in uh, country code is US. The location, we're going to actually give you Latin longitude of that, just in case you want to do some geo queries on that. Uh, we're going to give you the elevation. Uh, I should have put the units, I like to put the units of the field name there so you know that that's meters or whatever. Uh, so that's the elevation of the station ID. So if you only wanted to search for the temperature on records that were in you know, above a thousand meters or something, you could do that. You're going to get the state code is Arizona, and the state is or state code is AZ. The state is Arizona, and the name of the station is Scottsdale Munici Municipal Airport. Uh, also, you could have said, say, let's say these values. I didn't. I in this particular example, I didn't uh, change what T max and T min were. Those are the temperatures. That's probably Celsius. So, you know, maybe you would want to make those Fahrenheit or something, or at least annotate that so that the field name is something other than Tmax. gives you a little more clue. Uh, it depends. It, yeah, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, the other thing uh, that isn't exactly clear here is the example code will also filter. We're, gonna, we're only going to copy records that come from stations in Arizona. So that's going to be something else we, we filter this record on, uh, filter this on. Uh, the example doesn't fully add up. The code, if you go look in the, uh, I need to make changes to the code in GitHub so that it actually um, does all of this filtering correctly. Uh, so this is a little contrived right now, but this is a, it's still good to motivate the, the example problem. Uh, okay, so let's, okay, so, so that's our first job, right? We have this raw stream. Well, what we want to do is we want to uh, make a modified stream filtered and, and, and so I would call this filtered and enriched right so it's enriched by adding all this extra information all right so say you had a farm near USW 003192 and you wanted an email an SMS or a notification if T min was uh, approaching freezing that's kind of a sensible likely thing you might want to do so what we would what would we do <clears throat> we could take our input record from modified stream we could write uh, uh, some filter code that watches, that filters for a condition and a specific station and alerts a user. So what might that look like? And so now this is an example, just a tiny snippet. This doesn't have any of the setup code. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So this is a little bit of the setup code. This is in Python how you would set up the uh, Kafka consumer. And this is the async consumer. Uh, so you tell it, read off this topic, uh, this loop here, this is a little bit of just set up for the uh, async code. Bootstrap servers, so uh, typically the way Kafka client libraries work in C or Node or, and actually ironically, despite all this being in Python and me running the Python group, all of our work is done in Node.js. Uh, but all, all of the clients typically work you give them a bootstrap server. You say, oh, here's, here's one or a set of Kafka servers. You don't have to tell it all of the Kafka servers. Usually you give it a few, and then it'll find from that one broker who all of its peers are. And generally, you know, you want to 
give it a broker in one rack and give it one broker in one rack and one in another just in case you have a rack outage or something. So kind of spread things out a little bit. So you give it the, uh, you give it the topic name, you give it the list of bootstrap servers, uh, you give it your group ID, which in this case is the consumer group that I mentioned. So every consumer has to have a unique consumer group. And then this is setting the auto offset reset to earliest or latest. Oh yeah, this is just the reset. This isn't telling it where to start consuming. Oh yeah, no, since there aren't any offsets for this consumer group, uh, since the consumer group, presumably, this is the first time we're running the program, there aren't any offsets existing for this. So that means this is the policy that it will use when there aren't any valid offsets, which if there are none, because it hasn't been created, uh, then there aren't any. So then it's going to use, it's going to, by saying earliest here, that means it's going to start at the beginning of the queue. If you said latest here, it'll start at the end of the queue. <coughs> or actually, the earliest and latest is a good, good, actually that makes a lot of sense because it's time based, right? Your earliest records, those are the ones you want to read or do you want to start with the latest records? So those are the things you need to do when you set up your consumer. Uh, then I've, there's a lot of other code that isn't shown here that's shown in the, either at the end of this presentation or in GitHub. Uh, here's a process method, uh, process function. So, yeah, it's not called there. So there's a, there's a line here that says, okay, what do, I, what do I have these consumers do? You give it this process function. And this process function uh, basically takes in a data array, which is an array of records. So the way the consumers work is it, it's, pretty, it's, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome in that there's background threads that are continu continuously filling buffers in your client with data coming from Kafka. It only gives records to your actual code when it's requested. So basically, the, the thing that calls this process function will pass in a data array. That data array will just take kind of like the, la the last thing in the, or the, mo you know, the, the oldest stuff in the queue that had been read, off of, uh, read out of Kafka some er time earlier. So you have this data array. You have some definition for alerts here. That I'm going to say, I don't have the criteria here. I just have the list of people. And basically, this is mapping email addresses to, which, by the way, if you have any questions about Kafka, you want to email me and ask me. There's my email right there, godbridgeemail.com. Uh, so this is basically mapping emails to station IDs. So down here, you'll see we loop over all of the records in the array. Uh, and then for all of the alerts in the alert list, we want to see if, if the record that we are looking at contains the station ID and temperature min is below this threshold, which is you know silly that it's hard coded here, but this is just for an example. The temperature, the alert temperature is hard coded in here. You're going to uh, add an email. Now this is this is this is something that's uh, a little different. We we don't send the email from here. We don't actually trigger the action. What we're doing here is we're augmenting this record and copying it in here and then writing it into here. But, so basically, I am <clears throat> appending this email to that, uh, to that record, writing it into the alert stream, and then some later process will read the uh, alert, uh, uh, alert records off of the alert stream and then send the email. That way you can queue up as many, like if this is writing too fast, and then you, you know, your, email, your email guys take too long to happen, at least you can queue up the things, even if you can't send email at that right rate. But it's kind of good to, you, you, you build up, you can build up these buffers in Kafka in your, in your environment such that if one process slows down, everything can kind of still keep going and it can gradually build up. And that's one of the huge benefits of Kafka is that you can buffer for unanticipated things happening downstream. Uh, so basically, I annotate these records by adding uh, an email, adding the, the, the person who needs to be notified, adding that to to the records, writing that out. There's a lot of smarter ways to do this, of course. You probably just want to add a user identifier. You probably don't want to tie it to email necessarily. But basically, we're filtering for specific conditions and, and, and providing notifications to specific users. So why, why do I bother to write it rather than just sending the email right away? Um, 
Well, it allows you to scale those two things separately. You can, you can handle a, an influx of alerts and then email them out. Like I said, you can buffer that if you can't email fast enough or, or do whatever. It also allows you to separate the conditional logic, separate the conditional logic from the result. It allow, uh, oh yeah, if you just alert directly, you can't do other things with those records. So now that you've stored this alert stream, if you store it long enough, you can, you can later build additional processes that do other things. Like let's say you're like, oh yeah, I just emailed all those people. And your boss comes to you and he's like, well, who did you email? And you're like, oh, well, I guess we could get that from the email server logs, but our other, the rest of our process didn't store that. So then you could go back and say, oh, well, you could reprocess that and start storing that. In, you know, you could say a, you could generate a daily report of all the people who were alerted. So you don't have to know everything in advance if you're starting to kind of build this stockpile of, because this, actually, to get a little philosophical about how your business or organization may operate, you, you, you don't, it's unfortunate if you, it, once you start stockpiling kind of this sort of information in your organization, you can start doing new things that you hadn't anticipated. And this is kind of a powerful thing. Uh, when you talk about the data you have and what you can do with it. If you had to know everything you were going to do with your data from day one, that, that, would, be, that would be difficult. You, you don't. You absolutely don't know, right? Um, so it just depends on your need, needs. Topics aren't really expensive. If it's not 10 terabytes of data, then it's not that bad. And even since everything is size and time constrained, you can say, you know, we can accept the fact that if the boss comes up, and says, who did you email yesterday? Well, if you only stored two days worth of data, you can answer that question for him. If he came and said, who did you email last month? Well, then you're in a bit of hot water. But you know, at, least, at least you can say, well, you know, we only actually have two days of that information. You, we didn't know that was a requirement for the project. You know, let's look at this sort of that. OK. So anyways, it's, it, it kind of leaves, it leaves you some more options. Of course, you could just send the email right away if you really want to. OK. So that's kind of the idea of Kafka. That's the idea of how many? Yeah, that's probably good. Uh, that's kind of the idea of Kafka. That's the kind of the idea of stream processing. Um, all of this, the relevance for Linux folks, I don't run any Windows computers. I run 3,500 Linux machines. Uh, and all of this is Linux, open source, Kafka, Elasticsearch. Uh, actually, so uh, TerraSlice is a, an open source tool that we've written that reads and writes from, and actually, this, so even though this is a Python presentation, uh, the tool we use is a Node.js tool called TerraSlice. It's open source. It doesn't have many users but us, but we've been using it for years. We process, with TerraSlice, we process probably hundreds of billions of records a day. Um, it's not 1.0 yet. We're trying to push for 1.0. Um, we're hiring Node.js developers if you want to do that, or uh, and data engineers. So if that's interesting to you, so look for Terra, TerraScope is the company. Uh, but that's you know I just wanted to talk. But Linux, it's all Linux. Linux is awesome. I'm sorry my laptop is a Mac. Uh, so let's see. I will I will talk about uh, I will at least talk a little bit about the Kafka and Python. So there are two options for right now. There are two major options for. Kafka libraries in Python. There's Kafka Python, which really just looks and behaves like the Kafka client. It's a little bit Pythonic. Uh, but then there's an async client, which you'll get faster I.O. with. Uh, but then you have to be super careful about what you do in your loops and things like that, because that can block your I.O. Uh, things start getting messy when you start doing async. Uh, but this is basically, I, I did this presentation just because of an example for doing async in Python. And, seeing how it works in interaction with, with Kafka. So we basically have this consume, process, produce loop. So you read some records, you process those records, you do something with those records. And you know if you're reading from and writing to Kafka, you read, you do something, you write to Kafka. You consume, you, pro you, you process, you produce. So we've kind of seen that example. Uh, you can go read through these slides, or even better, go look at the GitHub. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see here it's kind of the guts. So I call the consume on the consume on the right consumer group. I give it the size that I want to read, 
and then I process. So this is where that process function was called. I process that data array. I pass in the data array that came out here. And then you can see that that processing will happen when that's completed. Then the, um, uh, it will send that to the producer. And that's basically, that's basically the whole, most of the Python program that, uh, that would do kind of the guts. You just basically change what happens in process here and you kind of have uh, uh, change the topics you're reading from and writing to and the uh, change what you do in the process section and you can kind of riff on that. Uh, what TerraSlice does is it generalizes this. You, it allows you to create a, uh, uh, a JSON manifest for a job that describes where you want to read from, what things you want to do to the records and where you want to write it to. And that's just kind of the general, uh, kind of a generalized solution for this sort of problem. And yeah, so let's see, just want to get to the homework. Okay, so yeah, and actually if people are interested in this, I can invest more time and I can do like a remote online, maybe uh, YouTube live video chat kind of thing and we could go through examples here. But if you look at this, this is a link to the uh, GitHub repo or if you just went to GitHub, look for the Desert Pie group find the presentations project, and in there is a Godber, which is my last name, Godber-AIO, Kafka, is, is, the, is the directory that contains all the source code. Uh, and what it does is it grabs some sample data. There's a make file that helps you bootstrap uh, Kafka cluster. It'll load some data. It'll pre-process, which by the way, the pre-processing on this uh, data, uh, I don't think it would have finished on my laptop. Uh, but it, hap it finished in just a couple minutes on my uh, Linux desktop, which has 32 gigs of RAM. Finished pretty quick like that. Uh, Pre-processes some data, and then it like slowly, st I have a little wrapper script that will slowly spit that into your Kafka topic. So you can have a pretend stream. Unfortunately, the resolution of this, the real time resolution of this example data is not, it's like hourly. So to, to use that for a development example, if you tried to do it real wall clock time, it would be a little boring because you would only process like a few records an hour. Uh, <laughs> generally, people want to work a little faster than that. But yeah, it, it reach out to me. I, I, the, there are some folks in the Desert Pie group who are kind of interested in following up a little bit. If anyone else is interested in this, I'd be happy to, I don't know, I've never done a YouTube live stream or anything. It'd be a goofy thing to try. Uh, but I'd be happy to try it. Uh, yeah, so I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah, so there's, uh, oh, I should have put my direct URL up there, but uh, the data, the example data that I'm using actually came from this Elasticsearch. Uh, Rally is their uh, benchmarking tool, and they just kind of use this for that, and I'm like, oh, that's a good source. And then the A uh, AIO Kafka project is the, a lot of my examples were, yeah, and I should have actually put the Kafka docs here because some of my slides were taken verbatim from, Kafka docs. And then, oh, yeah, I forgot to delete that and update that date. But yeah, oh, yeah, here you go. This is the presentation can be found at this URL too in the Godber AIO Kafka. No questions during the presentation. Are there any questions now? Did I talk too fast? It's a lot of material. And if you're not familiar with stream processing, then it may just be confusing. It was confusing to me for many months. <laughs> I'm just curious about the part where um, you read the data of a certain size into your data array. And that size, is it always specified in like number of records or what do you Yeah, guess? yeah, it's a number of records. Yeah. And that's, that's a tunable parameter that, you know, is kind of something that you can optimize for your workload, but it's super workload specific. Uh, but, but keep in mind, that's only... And I tried to point this out, and I'm not sure. Sometimes I talk too fast, and I don't know whether, uh, regardless, regardless of whether you, you know, you ask for 100,000 of the records, and then you process that, it's still reading. The client, the consumer, is still reading in the background. It fills a buffer. So if your processing is too slow, the the rate at which you're actually processing, you you can. In, the way, and this is what TerraSlice does, you have to increase parallelism, you have to add more workers to the job. And that's one of the amazing things about Kafka, is that as you add workers, so if you were to run another program on the same consumer group, it would, it would just be processing 
the same data but not the same records. It would just be added as if it were the same application. So as you increase the number of workers, you can trivially increase the number of consumers in a, in a Kafka job and then it will just distribute the work across those workers. So if those workers are actually running on different computers, which is one of the things that TerraSlice helps you do, uh, it, um, let's see, it, it will speed up your process. Because a lot of times if, you're, if, the right, if the rate at which your data is coming in is super fast and you just run one you know, Python or Node.js process to try and consume that, you realize, oh wait, at this point I'm CPU bound here, I'm CPU limited. So I need to spread this out and run on more CPUs. So once you do that, Kafka allows you to spread that easily. And um, in this particular example, there's no convenient mechanism to spread it out. You'd have to like SSH to another computer, run another one of these Python programs, and then you would get an increased throughput. Um, but that's kind of, I'm sorry. I, have I gone on a tangent? I have. Oh yeah, because you asked just about the number of records. I'm sorry. I'm really good at tangents. It's one of my skills. Uh, did you have any other thoughts or questions or anyone else? Yes. 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 Uh, so that, yeah, that, that's definitely going to happen. That's definitely a guarantee. Now the thing is, there's, I didn't point this out in the code, but there's a point at which the offsets get committed. So <clears throat> when you're done with, when you're done with processing that batch of 100, th you, there's a call, a, a call you make that commits the offsets back on the Kafka server that says, okay, these are the records that I've now processed. And then that gets stored so that if everything dies, you can start everything back up and your consumer is going to start at that committed offset. It's kind of a, this really the part about talking about Kafka could be five times longer, unfortunately, because there's a lot to it. But basically, these, these committed offsets, that stores how far you've gotten through the processing queue. And that, once you do that commit, that, that gets stored. Now, the, what happens to the stuff in the buffer? That's just going to get lost. Any records that were in the buffer? But, that, but that's OK, because you're going to go, you're going to go, because those are just in the buffer. Those haven't even been read out by your process, by your processing function. That's just sitting in the buffer. Every, if everything dies, it's going to pick right back up to the last place that was committed. And that works out. It's, it's messy. Do you have further? No? OK. Um, so my, my first thought when I hear things like this is something pertaining to data science in terms of use case of it. What are some use cases you see for it? Um, well, so well, a fraud detection could be a thing, for instance. Like let's say, um, imagine you're a credit card company. Imagine you're a credit card company and you have all of your transactions are just getting dumped in the front door and you know that Austin Godber's credit card has been stolen. So you could write a process that says, looks for either my ID or my credit card number. And when that happens, you can say, oh, hey, you need to go stop this transaction. Do not let this transaction happen. Or go, you know, you can, you can basically react to something like that. That's one of, that's one of the, that's the, kind of like a stream processing primary function, right? Is like, you can do things real time. Like alerting the farmer, right? Hey, your fields are going to freeze. Right, they can text me or something, right? So that's, so that, things, things like that. Or uh, like, I don't know, if you can look for something in your uh, web server logs, or. I was gonna say, can it be a replacement for syslog? Um, you, it wouldn't be a replacement for syslog, but you could take syslog and redirect those logs into Kafka, absolutely. Yeah, it wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to. So use that like a sim? I'm sorry. Could you use it like a sim, like a, like uh, drawing correlations, or it just does simple queries? Well, the what it so the Kafka really is just the queue, right? It's just really the 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 set of records, and you have to build the application that 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 does something with the data. Yeah, it's basically it's it's think it, it serves the same role as a database, right? It's like you, you have records in it, you look at those records, and you want to do something with those records. You have to make the application that, 
So you would create a topic called cron and take everything from syslog as cron information and dump it into that topic. Right? You, could, you could do that if that were if if seeing if if doing if looking at and doing specific things to only the cron records. Yeah. So you could like you, like like you suggested, you could take all of syslog, dump that into a raw topic, raw a raw syslog topic. Then you could write an application that only grabs the cron record the records that come from cron write that into another topic and then you could do something with that over here if if that were useful to you so that so it's not it's not something that you would use just on a single computer it's like if you had a bunch of stuff going on and you wanted to kind of consolidate that and do things off of that data set yep it's a class yeah it would be it would be it's it's too too big and complicated just to replace syslog with. So you'd still have syslog, you'd, you'd just tell syslog to write to a socket, and then you might have to use something to redirect from that socket into Kafka. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts or? Yeah. You mentioned cost. Is that just related to CPU time and such, or is it? Well. Well, so there's so there's many components in here, right? So actually, that's a good question. Um, like there's lots of pieces, so and each piece kind of has its different cost, right? So on on these guys, uh, Kafka is not CPU intensive. Kafka itself, if you were to go buy servers for Kafka, you'd be looking for disks, and not even super fast disks. Uh, and you wouldn't even raid them necessarily because it provides redundancy kind of at the, it gets a little, uh, there's some splitting of pairs you can do there. Uh, but there's redundancy at the service level, so you don't even need to raid the disks. Maybe it helps you with maintenance uptime kind of thing. Maybe it's, maybe it helps you there, but. Can you extract your raw log stream back out of it? Yeah, so you can write, you can write, uh, like just line delimited records, you could write uh, CSV. I mean, you could just basically write, you know, new line delimited records. We could a new line delimited data could just be something you write there. Or uh, actually, that that's typically what we we put in. But you can put other things like uh, like Confluent is one of the commercial entities around Kafka. They always use um, Avro, maybe. I might be remembering the wrong thing. Is that, yeah. do I have that right? We're using Confluent where I'm at. Yeah, and they're, they're big about, they're big with schemas and Avro. And when we started, none of that stuff really existed. Confl Confluent was, you know, just a twinkle in someone's eye, I think. And they, uh, uh, so yeah, I, I, everything we do is just JSON, line delimited JSON, uh, which is not, not as unperformant as you might first guess. Like I said, we do hundreds of thousands of records a second on a seven node cluster, right? And I mean, it would be faster if it were a binary, <laughs> a binary uh, protocol, but, but. Well, we tell Cut for Elastic, we tell customers that if they want an original copy of the stream, essentially, that they should do that separate from Elastic. Because Elastic's, once you put it in there, you, yeah. can't, you can't rebuild the beast, right? You slice the dice. Um, and, uh, and it's very redundant as far as you're not going to lose data when it's in there. Sure. But you can't rebuild the, the original. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Elast uh, I love Elasticsearch too. I, Alaska, like, so the three things I've learned in this job, and so this is a new, like, it's, it's been fun because it's been like a new, like, high performance, large scale type thing. And I mean, I, I, I've, I was a Linux system administrator 20 years ago, right? Ran a web server, ran an email server, just a few things, and then I, this, this job, I've learned a lot of new, interesting things. And, uh, among them is Elasticsearch is super cool, giant distributed databases. So we specialize in all sorts of distributed systems. Kafka and Elasticsearch being critical. Kubernetes is incredible. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big learning curve, but it's super, super capable. Um, yeah, yeah, Ela uh, Elasticsearch is awesome. Uh, let's see, did I fully address your question or did I get one of those awesome tangents? What was your question? I completely forgotten. <laughs> oh yeah, the costs. Oh yeah, I was gonna ra I was gonna go on a tangent about costs. Okay, it's all free. It's all free. None of it's free. It's all super expensive. Uh, well, actually, the software is free. It's <laughs> the the power is not free. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the disk I/O is own. Disk storage is the most driving, most important thing. Lots of spindles on your servers is good because then you can distribute that I/O across multiple spindles. If you're mostly reading at the head of the queue, which is true most of the time, but when it's not true, then you have people starting back at the beginning, and that becomes costly. If everybody ends up having to read from the beginning of the queue, that's a lot of out of sync disk I.O. If all the disk I.O. is in sync, then the first guy who reads it gets it off a disk, puts it into memory, and all the other people who go to read it uh, get the advantage of that being cached. So that it's cool when that works out, which sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so disk and disk I.O. are the things that I'm watching on my Kafka servers. Uh, okay, now over here, this little baby arrow, it doesn't look like a big deal, but uh, this Python example wasn't necessarily a good one, but if you're using TerraSlice, this could be a job with 100 workers distributed across 100 different computers. And how much work those do depends on what your process function does, right? If you're just, at, if you're just doing a simple annotation and saying, you know, doing a, a lookup of some sort from zip code to, to uh, state, that's an easy thing to do. That's not going to be too complicated. But if you have a couple of fields and you need to do a bunch of math, and then you, like if, or, or even worse, you need to do I.O. to another system to, to do your enrichment, that can get expensive. So this can either be CPU intensive. And uh, yeah, Hans or anybody, if you want me to shut up, just let me know, just like wave at me. Uh, but this can be either CPU intensive or I.O. intensive. You're going to want to minimize the I.O. that any of your workers do because you have to call out to another system. You're going to have to wait 100, you know, uh, tens of milliseconds or something instead of per record maybe. I mean, you want to be smart if you're working at, at speed and volume. Uh, so this can be CPU intensive. So mostly these guys, these guys are, these guys are mostly disk stuff. These guys, and most of these problems, as long as you have enough disks here, uh, you can scale out your CPU demand to as many computers as you want, you know, to a bunch of computers. And these guys really won't, the, the Kafka brokers won't really have a problem with, like, I, you know, I should have looked up the number of consumers that we have running. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, we probably have 12, around, uh, over 1,000. Over over a thousand individual processes reading off of our various Kafka servers, Kafka brokers, and so some of those, you know, they're memory intensive things. They've got big things stored in memory to do enrichment type stuff, or yeah, and those that ten, tends to be where you invest. So these these things here is where you invest in your CPU and memory. And if you're using Elasticsearch, you have a lot of you want a lot of memory. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Generally, yeah, I, yeah, that could be anything too, S3 or whatever. Yeah. So the Any other thoughts or questions or? All right. Well, thank you all very much.